scriptures because now that has become part of me. I think you understand that I wake up in the morning, I can take my bath. I don't need too much of, uh, you know, the uh, prayer and fasting and the grace of God and the power of God to take my bath. That has become part of me. I can do that without grace. And I think you now understand that you sisters can put on your scarf without quiet time, without prayer, without grace, without anything. And you men can uh, refrain from drinking. You have not drunk a beer for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. I think by now you have even forgotten the taste of beer. And it doesn't take grace and it doesn't take a power. It doesn't take the Holy Spirit for you to refrain from drinking beer. That's natural now. That's part of you now. And I think you understand too that uh, for me to tell a lie now, that's very, very difficult whether I pray or not, because that's not part of my character. It has not been for more than 20 years. Originally, when I was, you know, just a young Christian, I needed, you know, all the grace I could get. I needed all the strength I could have, so that by the grace of God, I will not tell a lie. But think about it now. It's become part of the way we live, that you don't need any special grace, so that you will not tell a lie. Now think about it now that I do not go to the nightclub, I do not go to the prostitute. Maybe for some young Christians that may take a lot of grace and a lot of uh, prayer and a lot of you know, spiritual uh, blessing channeled into their lives. But I do not even think about it except when I'm preaching and I want to make illustration. I do not think about prostitutes and all that. Now can I say then, then I have arrived. No, I can do all that without much grace. I'm so busy that I do not have time for all those things. And, but the apostle said, the righteousness I'm talking about, not the righteousness of the law. The things I could carry out mechanically. And think about when we say we're going higher. Many of the things that people say they are going higher in, they are things that you can do mechanically. And you are rejoicing that I am at this level now, I'm at this level now, but that's where you have been all these years. But Paul the apostle said, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Now, we're talking of higher ground of fellowship with God. Abraham had fellowship with God. Isaac had fellowship with God. But wasn't there a difference? Then we know that Moses had fellowship with God. Aaron had fellowship with God. Wasn't there a difference? Samuel had fellowship with God. David had fellowship with God. Wasn't there a difference? Jeremiah had fellowship with God. Jonah had fellowship with God. Wasn't there a difference? Matthew was a disciple. Peter was an apostle. A disciple, rather. They were both apostles and disciples. But wasn't there a difference in apostleship? At least, you know, Matthew didn't go to the... Uh, Mount of Transfiguration. Oh yes, he wrote about it. And we can write about it too, but we've not been there. We can sing about it too, but have you been there? Are there not many things we sing about, we write about, we counsel about, and we have not been there? Think about this. I am pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Stop that. And now give me a testimony of the heights you read today, which you didn't reach yesterday. And you are dumb. Because you, you don't have that. We sing it. New heights. New heights. New heights. I am gaining every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. You know, a man singing like that, there is never a sort of backsliding. He says, every day I'm gaining new ground. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. We, they sing this song where they believe eternal security. Where they believe that once you are saved, you are forever saved. All you are going to have, all you will ever have, you have got it at salvation. No sanctification. No baptism in the Holy Spirit. No gifts of the Spirit. There is no higher ground really for them. Yet they sing, I am pressing on the upward way. Why are they deceiving themselves? Because they have been saved. And they are forever saved. And there is nothing like sanctification. And there is no Holy Ghost baptism. There is no power of God. There is nothing higher than salvation. You've got everything. And then it says, 
my heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and fears dismay. Then he comes to you and he say, well, our church, I don't understand. They don't have faith in God. There's a lot of doubt. There's no healing. And, uh, you know, they fear the devil. They fear demons. They fear this. They fear, they fear everything. And then you say, well, I've got something better for you. Can you follow me? And let's go to deeper life. Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to change church. Then stop singing the song. My heart has no desire to stay. No desire at all to even stay there. Where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my constant aim is higher ground. They sing it for 10 years and remain where doubts abide. Think about it. And they do not understand. That's what I said. There is a difference between Matthew and Peter. They were apostles. And we can all be born again, all Christians, some born again people here, some born again people there, and we're all singing higher ground, higher ground, but we don't mean it. Beyond the mist, I fain would rise to, to rest beneath unclouded skies, and not your skies cloudy, misty, and not your skies filled with doubts and fear and oppression and hindrance and limitation? For how many years now? And yet we have remained like that. And it says, above earth, turmoil, peace is found by those who dwell, who dwell, who remain on higher ground. How surprising it is that here we are now. And then we say, yes, this time I'm going on higher ground. And then we come back for another workers' retreat, and we have not been dwelling on higher ground. I long to scale the utmost height. You know what that means? Go beyond the height of Moses. Well, we say we're living by grace. We say that Jesus has come. We say that the cross has made a difference between the old dispensation and the new dispensation. But... Have we actually risen as high as Abraham, the friend of God? We say that Jesus said, and he did, that the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. And John was greater than all the other people that lived before him. And that is true. But where are we? I long to scale. I desire to scale the utmost height. Don't rough the way and hide the fight. My song, while climbing, shall resound. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lead me up the mountainside. I dare not climb without my guide. But with my guide, I must climb. And when eventually heaven I gain, I'll gaze around with grateful heart. Because now I'm the highest point of all. I'm gazing from higher ground. Lord, lift me up. I'll not stay here. I'll not stay in the plain. I'll not stay in the valley. Lift me up. Let me stand. I won't be crawling. I won't be fainting. I won't be doubting. I won't be perplexed. I won't be unsure, uncertain. Lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. Where love and joy and light abound. Lord, plant my feet. You know what that means? Plant my feet. You know some people are so easily shaken. They are here today. They are there tomorrow. That place, they are there tomorrow. Next week, they are in another place. There's no stability. There's no concrete experience. Their minds are always saying, where will I be? Will I be here? Will I be there? Will I still stay? Will I still go? Lord, let me have that as a past tense experience. Now plant my feet. But I don't want to be planted anywhere. There are people, you know, I want you to picture in your mind. A ladder going up. And all these ladders, all the ladder that is going up, you have the wrongs. And you have some churches below the beginning of the ladder. Many, many of them. That where you put the ladder, before you even start to climb, there is a valley below the beginning of the ladder. And many churches are even there. No salvation. No Christian life. No understanding and revelation of Jesus Christ as the only Savior that saves totally from sin. Then picture some other churches on the first rung of the ladder. And if you go there, no matter what convention, no matter what retreat, no matter what seminar, no matter what conference, that all those churches, they are on the rung of the ladder. 
And there's nothing you can do in that place. Because they won't throw you up. You won't get beyond that place where the church is placed. Then another church is on the other rung of the ladder. Now, which church do you think are more than three rungs of the ladder? And yet, do you think that it's only these three rungs, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, that that is the climax of it all before you get to heaven? Is there nothing beyond that? I'll show you. And you'll see that many, many churches, some, the majority are even below the beginning of the ladder. And when you are praying, you are saying, Lord, don't plant my feet in this place. It's not the place. Plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, do it for me. Plant my own feet on higher ground. Higher ground of fellowship with God. Number two. Higher ground in Christ means higher ground of consecration and commitment to God. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. The mind of Christ. What does it look like? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind, you know, is the place from which we think and the place from which we plan. What was the mind of Christ? Many times there are people that will say, my, heart, my mind is confused. My mind is uncertain. My mind is not in a position now to take decision. Will that be the mind of Christ? So pure? So clean? So sure and certain? Never confused? Never uncertain? Never troubled? The mind of Christ? Never perplexed? Let this mind, the whole mind of Christ, Never stained with hatred. Never stained with doubtful thoughts. Never stained with unbelieving ideas. The mind of Christ. You see, that it, that it is. This mind in you, which was also in Christ. Then it says, who being in the form of God, thought it not troubly to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of his servant. Bent unto death. Even the death of the cross. And you know, the apostle is saying, let that mind be in you. Mind of humility. Genuine humility. Deep, deep, deep rooted humility. It's not just the external ones. I told you that, you know, there are some things that we carry out by just tradition. In our tradition, women kneel down. When they greet elderly people. Whether you do that or you don't do that, that is not talking of. You can do that without grace. How many people are doing that without grace in our world? And you know how men also, you know, bend a little or bend much? Well, you can do that with grace or without grace. The point is this. The mind of Christ, when that mind is in you, there will be a deep-rooted humility. That even though you are high in the Lord, that Jesus Christ was even being in the form of God. It wasn't trouble at all that he was equal with God. Yet, voluntarily, he made himself of no reputation. There was no single desire to do it. That's higher ground. There was no stain of depravity, of the corrupt human nature to have that done. He made himself of no reputation. And he voluntarily took upon him the form of a servant. And he wasn't a servant on Sunday and then another thing on Monday. It was a permanent type of state of mind. And he was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Already he had given up his own glory before he came. Now he furthermore humbled himself and he even became obedient unto God until death. The death of the cross. Consecration and commitment to God. That you say, Lord, I'll be nothing, you'll be everything. That's higher ground. You'll possess everything, and I will not lay claim to this is my own, this is what I must do with it. 
I'm the one that owns my life, my time, my talent, my everything, and I want to do what I like. There's nothing like that. There's a deep humility that you know that all you have is by grace. Higher ground, fellowship with God, higher ground of consecration and commitment, higher ground of love and compassion. Love to saints, compassion to sinners. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, chapter 3, verses 12 and 13. And the Lord make you increase and abound in love, one to another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you. The Lord make you to increase higher ground, to abound higher ground in love, one towards another, and toward all men, even as we do towards you, as we do apostolic love. There is Christian love, and there is the love from the sanctified heart, there is the love that is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost. And there is this love that goes beyond measurement. I'll read another passage for you to know that and to understand that. The apostolic love. That the apostle was saying by the inspiration of the Spirit of God. And he said, you must have this love and let it increase, let it abound. Towards one another in the church. And towards all men outside the church. And do it even as we do towards you. Now, when Paul brings in himself and he says, as we do towards you. You understand? That's the love that made him to go to these Gentiles to preach to them. That's the love that made him to say, I count not my life as anything. But I'll preach the gospel to these people. That's the love that made him to say, I wish myself accursed from Christ so that I could win my king's men and win them to the Lord. That's the love that made him to say, I'm in continual heaviness for these people because he says for all men, that you have this love for all men. And he says, I'm in continual sorrow and heaviness because of these people that are not saved and they seem to have a righteousness of their own, but not according to God's own righteousness. And he says, that type of love we have towards you, Thessalonians, wanting to give up anything and everything, let that love abide in you, increase in you, abound in you. What's higher ground? Higher ground is love and compassion towards saints and sinners. To the end, that he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, unblameable in holiness. A type of holiness that you cannot puncture holes in. It's transparent. It's so deep. It's beyond the reach of fault finding by men, women, demons, or angels. And it's so rich. And it is so full. And it is so wonderful, it says, it, you become unblameable. Your hearts become unblameable in holiness. That uh, you go beyond the point where the devil will be saying, look at this, look at this. Jesus first faced the people. And he said, which of you convinces me of sin? That's been unblameable in holiness. But... Your wife may easily convince you of sin. At least she sees you getting angry. She sees you saying, well, if you are not careful, I'm going to do this and do that. Your wife can do that. Blame you and say, well, I thank God because uh, you have a sanctification, 20th century sanctification. I don't know what you would have done if you were on earth at the time of uh, Peter or Paul. That uh, you say you are a worker in the church. Well, thank God for 20th century church. That allows every dick and hurry to be a worker. Think about it. If you were in Paul's church, 
I don't mean St. Paul's church in your town. <laughs> I mean the church where Paul was an apostle and a pastor and a teacher. And he has all these qualifications. And he does not only have them on paper, he has them in the mind, he has them in the heart, he has them in his, uh, in his bones, he has them in the blood, he has them in everywhere. He dreamt about it, he talked about it, he lived in it. And you're saying, I want to be a worker. I wonder how many of us say, Paul will just say, no, go to the altar and be praying. I don't know whether he would even allow you to witness. I mean, in an organized manner with the church. You can do the one that everybody does. But would you have been qualified? If your husband too can tell you that my wife, thank God you are saved, thank God. I don't want to take anything away from your Christian experience, my wife, but I hope the pastor never calls me to give a testimony about you. They want to send you to go and do something, and the pastor says, now, brother, what do you think about your wife? Uh, can we send her? Can, you, can we use her to do this? And you say, well... Grace can use anyone. That, uh, Pastor, you've told us that uh, it's not by power, it's not by mind. So, uh, I'll be praying along with anything you give her to do. I'll be grateful. And uh, after all, the Bible has said, you see your calling, brethren. How that not many wise, not many noble, not many mighty, but the foolish things of the world. And since the Bible accommodates the foolish, uh, you can use my wife. And then you get back home and you say, uh, Sister, the pastor called me and they said they want to uh, involve you. And the pastor asked me if I had anything to say. Well, I didn't tell a lie, but I didn't give pastor any detail. So please, when you go, it's now in your hand. If you misbehave, then you disqualify yourself. What I could have said, if they discover on their own, good luck to you. And how many of us are managing like that? That people are just quiet. Just quiet. That since God can use even Balaam's ass, why not let, give God a chance and use this ass too? And then the, the result will be with God. And all the glory will belong to God. If God can use so and so, but higher ground. Higher ground in law, where there is no bitterness, there is no bickering, there is no animosity, there is no anger, there is uh, no antagonism, there is no rebellion in the heart. There is so much love in your heart for the children of God in the church and for the men who are outside. That's higher ground. And then it says in Ephesians chapter 3, from verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love. Not just that you have this love to uh, put on the surface of your Christian life, to silence other people that at least you see the thing on the surface, but you are rooted in it. You are grounded in it. That it will grant you that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ. You know, I wonder, many, many Christians, millions and millions of Christians, they will not know any of the breadth or length or depth or height of the love of God till they die. It's not even in their agenda. It's not on their prayer list. What's on their prayer list? To preach. And the preaching is, you know, all uh, tensed up as if he's fighting with the people. As if he's even happier that they get to hell rather than they get to heaven. But the love of God, not preaching now. But the love of God saturating your heart, filling your heart, that you know the breadth and the length and the height of, of it. I wonder for these people who don't believe there's any other experience above salvation. Get saved and that's all. No other thing. No sanctification. No Holy Ghost baptism. And yet, even those of us who believe in the Holy Ghost baptism, we still need to remind ourselves that there is something more. At least, if there is nothing more, we shouldn't be singing this song after being baptized in the Holy Ghost. 
I am pressing on the upward way. New heights I am gaining every day. If there is nothing beyond being baptized in the Holy Spirit, then there is no new height to gain every day after being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So why sing it? Why don't just let us cancel that from our hymn book and forget it? And leave that to the people that are not baptized in the Holy Spirit yet. But those who wrote these songs, now do you understand? The songs that were singing, they were reaching many of them hundreds of years ago. They are not reaching by these new, new Christians. You know, the songs that all these new, new Christians can write, I mean, Charismatics and Pentecostals and Methodists. In fact, you know, Methodist Church, Baptist Church, Anglican Church, we're not writing hymns again. What songs do we have to write? What experiences do we have? What Bible do we understand? What things are we going to discover in the Lutheran Church that Martin Luther has not discovered? What things are we discovering in the Methodist Church that... Uh, John Wesley has not already discovered what song are you going to write that is higher than the songs that John Wesley, Charles Wesley has written. Why waste your time trying to compose song out of the head? Those inspired songwriters have written, their children are only to stand up or sit down and sing. The traditions of their fathers. And then what songs are we going to write in the Pentecostal church? The people that lived in, at the turn of the century, when all these uh, churches were rising up and the Spirit of God filled the people in the church, now they had a song to write. Only we just sing what they are preaching. Now all the charismatic, the people that are now living, all they can now sing is Bible verse. And thank God the Bible verses are there. And we just pick up the Bible verse and sing. No experience. Because if we're gaining new heights, there should be something, somebody talking about it, somebody writing about it, somebody singing about it. But we just sing this that had been written many, many years ago. I'm pressing on the upward way. The man that wrote it talked about himself. I am. And the people that are parroting it don't understand what was really written. New heights I am gaining every day. And there was no stopping place. Just new heights I'm gaining every day. And it says here, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge. Now listen to me. The love that passes knowledge. You know, before you got married, you didn't have enough knowledge about your wife, about your husband. And you had love, unstained, unaffected by anything you knew. All you saw was the facial appearance and the things that were physical, and also the testimony. Praise the Lord for this, praise the Lord for that. And therefore there was love, real love, deep love, I mean in the marital sense. And then you got married, and you had knowledge of this woman. This woman's tongue, sharper than your razor blade that you used to shave, our clothes, I don't mean the outward clothes, the real clothes that you didn't see before, which you now see every time, and you have sharp uh, smelling sense, and every time you just enter into that place, the clothes, oh, they smell a lot. And then apart from that, even, uh, you know, the body, because now, all that you saw before was the face. And the face was washed. And the face was, you know, made good. But now you can see that the body itself uh -uh, is another thing. And you wonder why we have so many soap factories in every state. And this woman will not consult these soap factories. And then the air, another thing. Because before marriage, it was all covered. And the insects and the dandruff and the smelling, everything was covered. And how you add love that passes knowledge. Because you didn't have the knowledge, there was that love. But now you are married. And you sleep together. And the smell of that air that is always covered when you are the only one that gets the bad part of it. You know, outside, it's covered, and it's so neat, and it's so presentable, and the clothes are all right, but you see the inside. 
And every time scratches, scratching that thing. And you say, sister, it's not your nails, it's the soap that will do the work. Go and wash this thing. No, 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 I don't want to be worldly. I'm a child of God. How about all these uh, insects? Well, I don't care. Uh, I'm just a child of God. All these things don't matter. All that matters is that you lay your treasure in heaven. But all these insects, are they going to be? <laughs> They're going to become part of the family. <laughs> now, with all that knowledge, to still love that person, that's the love that passes knowledge. That's the point. The love that passes knowledge. That with all the knowledge you know, the air dirty and everything not properly placed in order and yet to love that person. What love that is. That's in the physical, come to the spiritual. Here are our pastors that have given life, profession, career, everything. Before they came to the stage, when you were just young in the faith, you were saying, well, if we could have a, a leader, a pastor, now you love them. And they came and you rallied around, you looked for accommodation, you did everything. But now you have begun to know that his child is active. You know, he jumps up and down in the fellowship. And you happen to be an usher. Ah, why is the pastor say, child running up and down? Well, because God created all children alike. And God expects that children will exercise their legs. And the pastor's child is not an exception. But now you cannot love the pastor because of the knowledge you have about about the child. Now the pastor has come and his wife, uh, you know, uh, meets with people and talks to people and all the, uh, uh, is that because they have made a uh, women fellowship a leader that is just talking to everybody and because you have something against that, you also have something against the pastor. But why are you blaming the wife? No, nobody likes to be lonely. And if you don't come to the pastor's wife, then the pastor's wife, not wanting to live in isolation, will come to you and say, my sister, how are you doing? If you don't ask her, I'm doing, how are you doing? And because she is now, she doesn't want to be lonely. She wants to fellowship with the people where her husband is pastoring. Again, you have problem. And your love for the pastor has gone. But love that passes knowledge means no matter what you know, no matter what you hear, no matter what you see about that individual, your love is ever the same. It's increasing, not going down. The more you know, the, the more you know, even if you know things you feel might be bad. After all, many of the things that you say are bad are relative. The pastor didn't smile or he smiled too much. You know, you get into trouble everything you do as a pastor. If you smile, they say that he is smiling. He is not sober. If he is sober, he never laughs. He is not accommodating. If he is dirty, why is the pastor dirty like this? He cannot be an example to the congregation. If he is neat, he appears that he has a worldly taste. If he is lean, he doesn't have a good stature. Look at him. He says he's a pastor. And he's almost dying. He doesn't take care of himself. <laughs> if he's fat, all church money goes for ch chop money. <laughs> if he has a small house, well, you, you understand, he wasn't educated before he became a pastor. Even if they give him a good house, he cannot keep it neat. If he has a big house, he is covetous. Look at the type of house he's living in. Now, evaluation of the church about the pastor is relative. No matter what he does, some people will hate him for doing good. If he preaches all the time, you see, he never gives anybody any chance to preach. All the time, he's the one that has message. If he doesn't preach long enough and he doesn't preach often enough, he doesn't have material. That's why he, you know, he will preach and then give all these other people something to preach. What do you expect? If he preaches every time, he will be exhausted. What will the pastor do that we are not going to find fault with? But when you think your mind is finding that fault, the love that passes knowledge. The love that passes your evaluation. That's what the Bible is saying. That's higher ground. 
And it says, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge that whatever you know about your fellow brother, about your fellow sister, whatever you are being told about your fellow brother, about your fellow sister, there is still that love of Christ in you towards that individual. And that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the highest point. To be filled with all the fullness of God. When you are baptized in the Holy Ghost, you are not yet filled with all the fullness of God. There is still more. Let's go on. Higher ground of fellowship with God. Higher ground of consecration and commitment. Higher ground of love and compassion. Now, higher ground of loyalty to the Lord and to the leadership. Higher ground of loyalty to the Lord and to leadership. When you really say you are getting on higher ground, there is confidence in God in you that is growing higher, growing greater every time. And there is deeper, richer faith in you, faith in the Lord. And there is trust in the leadership. When you say you are going higher, loyalty to the Lord and to leadership. In Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. Verse 17, to obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for the watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Let's move faster. Higher ground also means you are getting to a higher ground of usefulness in Christ and productivity in the kingdom. Higher ground of usefulness in Christ and productivity in the kingdom. John chapter 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that he bear much fruit, so that ye, be, ye shall be, so shall ye be my disciples. And in verse 16, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. Well said, the higher you go, the more you will see, the more you will know, and the more useful you will be in the kingdom of God. And you have seen that that happens in every field, in education, in the government, even in the church, and in the Bible in those days, you've seen that the higher they went, the, the more they saw, the more they knew, and the more useful they were in the kingdom. How do we get to this higher ground? To start with, we must understand the higher ground is up, not down. The higher ground is up, not down. If you are always moving with the backsliders, you are going down, not going up. If you are always intimate with those who are in doubt of the possibility of going higher in the Lord, you are moving down, not up. If you are having intimate fellowship with so-called believers that say there is um, nothing more than salvation, Let's all remain down here. Once you are saved, you are always saved. And those are the books you are reading. Those are the ministers you are, reading, you are listening to. Those are the cases you are listening to. Remember, the higher ground is up and not down. And as long as you are fellowshipping with the people down there, listening to the people down there, moving with the people down there, and becoming intimate with the people down there, and patterning your life with the people down there, shaping your lifestyle with the people down there, you'll never come up. Higher ground is up. It's not down. Not only that, higher ground is ahead, not behind. 
And if you're always thinking about the things of the past, how I used to eat, how I used to live, I used to have a nice time, but in a sensual, social, worldly way. How I used to have so many friends, friends that had nowhere to go, not even heaven. As long as you are looking behind and thinking behind, you'll not be able to get to higher ground because higher ground is ahead, not behind. Number three, higher ground is in Christ, not in self. And if you are thinking about self, planning for self, pampering self, fulfilling the desires of self, giving in to the ambitions motivated by self, there will be no higher ground for you. Self-indulgence, self-praise, self-commendation, self-projection, self-promotion, selfish ambition. As long as you are involved with things connected with self, now understand. You may deceive yourself that you are not involved with self, but you are not the judge. God is the judge and is the only pilot that can take you to higher ground. You can't do it yourself. You can't fly off yourself. The pilot has to take you up. And if you are full of self, then God knows it. Your heart may not even know it. Because you may deceive yourself with language, with reasoning, with ideas and ideologies to convince yourself that there is no self in you and yet there is a lot of self-indulgence, self-promotion and selfish ambition. But you remember I've told you that higher ground is not in self, it is in Christ. And you need to go before the Lord and say, Lord, examine this heart so that I will know. Turn on the search light on this heart, so that I will know. And if there is any bit of self there, purge it away. Then, higher ground is more with the saints, not with the sinners. We evangelize the sinners, we preach to the sinners, we witness to the sinners, but they are not examples to our lives. We do not compare our families with the families of sinners. We do not compare our lot in life with the lot of sinners. We don't say, after all, uh, these sinners are having this. Because of them, I must have this. Higher ground is when you are more with the saints, in your thought life, in your planning life, in your desires, in your goals, in your ambitions, rather than with the sinners. More. Higher ground is at the center of God's will, God's word, and God's work, not at the edge. There are Christians that remain at the edge of the will of God all their lives. They are not totally out, they are not completely in. There are people that remain on the surface of the word of God. They are not away from it, but they are not totally deep in it, saturated with it. There are those people that consecrate a little and they get involved with the work of God, but just a little to silence their conscience. A little to say, after all, I'm, I'm also working for God now. So I hope that the Spirit of God will not be convicting me and bugging me, saying, you are not doing this, you are not doing that. They remain at the edge, but not at the real center but higher ground is at the very center of God's will, center of God's word, and center of God's work, not at the edge. How do we get to higher ground? I wish I could tell you that it is easy. But I can't tell you that. Because there is a price to pay in getting to higher ground. And if we don't pay that price, all we can do is sing about it, think about it, preach about it, talk about it. We cannot really get there without paying some price. And you know, today, many preachers and 
Many people, they like to tell you that everything is easy. That from the moment that Jesus said, it is finished on the cross, everything now has become easy. I haven't experienced it like that. I came and I heard about repentance. The devil didn't say, yes, the cross has made everything easy. Go ahead and repent. He waged war against my wanting to repent. I was taught about consecrating myself to the Lord. And I said, Lord, if that is what it takes, if I can only become the person you want me to be by consecration, I'll do it. The devil didn't encourage me and say, well, you want to consecrate to the Lord? That's fine. That's wonderful. Now go ahead and do it and I will not disturb you at all with any thought, with any hindrance. I didn't find it so. Then I was told about sanctification, the Adamic nature being uprooted and taken away. And I started praying. Now, I didn't experience it the way other people say, that, you know, everything is easy now. The cross has made everything easy. You want it, you desire it, you've got it. It's right there. I didn't find it like that. The devil didn't just fold his arm and say, now because of the cross, you go ahead and get sanctified. I'm so happy with it. No, it wasn't like that. I heard about being baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'll be talking about the baptism and after. It's on the program. I, I pray the Lord will give us the chance. Amen. Because uh, the baptism of today, they teach it how to receive it. The baptism of Bible days. They, you just know there is a baptism. Then you go into the chamber and you get something. Before you came out, you had got the real thing. You might never, in fact, all the people that are baptized in the Holy Ghost in the Bible, think about it. Acts chapter 2. They never saw anybody before that time speak in tongues. They never heard about speaking in tongues. I mean, in a very calculated sense, logical manner. Nobody ever taught them and said, now you're waiting in the upper room and, you know, the day of Pentecost has come. Now, here is how to pray. It wasn't like that. Think about it. And in um, Acts chapter 9, when Ananias came to Paul, the apostle, and he said, the Lord has sent me that you receive your sight and receive the Holy Ghost. He didn't say, now sit down, we're going to pray. You understand Greek, you understand the Aramaic, you understand Hebrew. Don't pray in Greek, don't pray in Hebrew, don't pray in Aramaic. Now just pray after me. And then Ananias speaking in tongues and he's speaking in tongues. Paul, the apostle, will not have been able to do what he did. With that type of experience. Impossible. That's why all these people, they're speaking in what they call tongues, and they're still confused. There's still no faith. There's still so much doubt. There's still so much oppression of the devil, and they're speaking in tongues every time. The speaking in tongues in the New Testament was not exercised to drive away the devil from the believer. The devil was far away. The speaking in tongues was for another thing. But today people say they are baptized in the Holy Spirit and they are being oppressed by evil spirit and they are speaking in tongues so that the devil will leave them alone. How Paul must pity the 20th century Christians. How Peter must look from the balconies in heaven and say, what are these games that these 20th century Christians are playing? That they're doing all these, uh, all these things. And they come to, you know, all these their conventions and seminars and conferences and convocation or whatever it is. Teaching one another, saying, oh yes, brother, that is it. And uh, Paul will say, nobody did that for me. And think of um, the house of Cornelius. Cornelius had never heard a single word about speaking in tongues. Nobody had taught him. Nobody had told him. And uh, Paul, uh, Peter was just speaking the word. And right there... The thing came on all the people that were seated there. Oh, that's something. That's wonderful. When somebody who has never read about it, never heard about it, somebody who has never been taught on how to speak in tongues, that you are just preaching and the Holy Ghost power came on them. No wonder they, they did what we cannot do today. But this one that we are carrying about, the substitute, the dope as flesh, and they are giving us the, dung's do, uh, the dung of the dough. The thing that came out. The waste to eat. Kenneth Hagin had, had his own experience. Nobody taught him. And now he teaches people how he got it. How he's doing it. How you can do it. Seven steps. Nobody gave any steps to all those people. Just give any. He went into the forest, into the woods. 
Nobody taught him. John Wesley, now you tell me. Is somebody had taught John Wesley how to speak in tongues, how to do this? Will John Wesley be able to do what he did? If somebody had taught John, Charles Finney how to do this, how to do that, like they have taught many of you, and that thing they taught you, since uh, five years ago now, you wake up in the morning and you say exactly the same thing. You jack a little, shake a little. <laughs> <laughs> and you say exactly the same thing for five years. Oh, I pity you Christians. Modern day Christians, we cannot wait upon the Lord. We're so much in a hurry. We want it ready made. And that's why they tell us everything is now easy. But I've not found it in the New Testament like that. Look at what Jesus said. You want to get to higher ground, you'll need to make up your mind. That that higher ground, I am getting there. And I'm not going to uh, have any substitute. I'm not going to have anything that another person will give me and say, this is how to do it, this is not how to do it. Look at uh, Acts chapter 19. And uh, Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And he said, uh, no, I have not. Uh, we, have, we have not even so much as heard. How then were you baptized? Then they told him, oh, John's baptism. All right, he told people about repentance and then baptism, uh, just waiting for the coming of the Son of God. And after he had taught them, he laid hands on them. And without any gimmicks, without any exercise, without any repetition, and without any technique and formula, without two steps and three steps, without amen and hallelujah seven times and faster, without kneeling, sitting, standing, bowing, bending, raising up hands, laid hands on them, and they received. That's what I want. If you know you have not got it, you'll be after it. If you, if you have a counterfeit certificate, the one that uh, somebody signed at the backyard of the office, when they put that in your hand, you'll not seek for the real thing. Who wants to go to the library and be studying when you have counterfeit certificate? Who wants to be born in the midnight oil and saying, I still want to get the certificate when they put something in your hand that is not real and you can use it to get a little work? I mean, you can use speaking in tongues now, certificate to get a little work among the Pentecostals. I speak in tongues, do it for me and let me see. You do it for them and let them see. That one, you can do it for them and let them see. It's not New Testament. You think that uh, when Paul saw those people at Ephesus, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? No, I have not. Let me do, for you, do it for you and you will see. Then that's how to do it. And then do it for them. You think it was like that? Are you happy? No. Uh, no, I'm, I'm preaching. I'm not asking you. Are you happy? Uh, yes, I'm happy. Do it for me and let me see. And then you begin to laugh. That's how to show that you're happy. All these uh, things that even deeper life people have got involved in. What a shame. Solomon's temple was built with gold. His son came in. They lost all the gold later. And they built it with an appearance of gold, but it was silver. They couldn't get the gold again. They couldn't get the real thing again. They had lost the gold. And now they just use silver. And they said, well, it's like age. And you remember when they built the temple and those young people were smiling and were laughing. The old people were crying. Oh, they said the glory has departed. That this house were built now is not like the original one. And the church must be crying today. All these things they're doing in conventions and seminars and conferences is not like in the days of old. All these things that the people said they have received. In all these Pentecostal circles, the speaking in tongues, the worship, the singing, the praying and everything, and they'll get out of that place and the sinners are not convicted of sin. And the people that are stealing, they are not convicted. And there is no divine judgment upon those people that are sinning. They are divorced and remarried, they smoke, they drink, they wear their trousers, uh, those women. They do a lot of things and they just have nice time, just singing and what they call worship. No, that's not what I want. In the last days, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters, they'll prophesy. How do we say we have the spirit of God? We have no revelation. We have the spirit of God. We have no power. 
We have the Spirit of God. We have no deep insight into the Scriptures. Look at all these people speaking in tongues in a Catholic church. And they still worship Mary. And it's the Spirit of Truth. Not of error. And this spirit of truth that they say is living in them and they are still speaking in tongues, they cannot know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Lord alone without partnership with Mary. They have that spirit and they are speaking in tongues. And he cannot show them the truth, the truth, the spirit of truth. Look at all these, uh, all these other people from all these churches speaking in tongues and yet they are not overcoming sin. And the speaking in tongues is there. You think that is the real thing? You think that is what they add in the New Testament. Oh yes, they paid the price. But today, we are not paying any price. Have you got the Holy Ghost? Have you got the Holy Ghost? Have you got... No. Okay, let's go. Uh, we are having a meeting. We are imparting. You, you hear that language? That's what they do now. We are imparting the Holy Spirit now. Therefore, let's go. You will get it before we come back. Are you sure? Oh yes. What do I need to do? Any preparation? No, not preparation at all. Sanctification? Oh no. That one is deeper life doctrine. No sanctification. And then they go in there. And they lock themselves up. And some of these people that are so careless and so adulterous, so lustful, they pack in all those girls and all those boys. And they say, now, uh, if you are, are you born again? Uh, somebody says, well, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, everybody must receive. So before, you, before we pray for the Holy Ghost now, if you have not been born again, raise up your hand. Then they raise up their hands. Now pray after me. No repentance. No conviction of sin. Nothing at all. No price to pay. No waiting upon the Lord. And then they said, they lead them. And they say, now, uh, I'm a sinner, I'm a sinner. Father, you sent Jesus Christ, you sent Jesus Christ to save me. He died for me on the cross of Calvary. Now I'm saved, now I'm saved. Amen, amen, amen. Now you just raise up your hand and praise the Lord. And they pray, now we're ready for the Holy Ghost. <laughs> That's why you're ready for the Holy Ghost. 20th century Christians, everywhere all over the world. And now they tell them, now we're going to receive. Everybody you are going to receive, no doubt, don't let the devil confuse you. You are now all children of God and you are going to get it. Amen, amen. And then they pray for them. Now you've got it. If it's only one syllable, like ba, like a, like a, that's all. That's the beginning. You've got the speaking in tongues. Who can't make a syllable? And then after they've done that, are you happy tonight? Wonderful. The Spirit of God has come. Now we are the generation that will conquer this, uh, this age for the Lord. It's a lie. You can't do it. Because there's no gold in that building. It's all silver. It's all make-believe. I don't want that. It may take seven years to get your degree. But go ahead and get it. It may take some real time alone, without anybody's help, without anybody's cajoling, without anybody's deceit, to get at the root of the sin and say, thank God I have the apostolic experience. And then you carry that certificate, the devil sees it to say, look, it's genuine. Signed with the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. This certificate is coming from heaven. Look at it. And he, there's no gainsay. He cannot doubt it. You have authority over him. But the one fake thing they give you, that the devil looks at it, and there is no genuine, bona fide signature on that thing, oh, no wonder that the church today is suffering, suffering. They talk about many, many countries. They say this country now is not allowing Christianity to move on. Ah, in the early church, they locked them in the prison. Angels brought them out and said, you have the Holy Ghost who cannot be locked up. Go back there and preach the gospel. That's experience. That's experience. They had no fear, neither of death or of the devil. And he said, which one are you telling us? We must speak of the things we have known, Peter of all people. That was so much of a coward. And he said, you think that we are going to cringe or crawl? Never. And when they saw the boldness in them, they knew that they had been with the Lord Jesus Christ. See that? That's the genuine thing. Now what I'm telling you today is that people say there is no price to pay. People say that everything is easy. And they have cancelled that song that says it is not an easy road. Oh, they say no, that's a bad song. That all those songs of the past that were singing, it's not an easy road. No, 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 it's not an easy road. That No, all those songs are not permissible again now. It's an easy road. 
Because the devil doesn't bother them. There is no temptation and there is no hindrance. There is nothing at all. All they just do now, claim it and have it. You name it, you claim it, you've got it. But how, what are they naming? They've not got anything. All that they are getting is, you know, a piece of land somewhere. What am I going to do with the land if I don't have the Holy Ghost? Maybe they are getting a motor car. What am I going to use a car for? Preaching the gospel. I don't need equipment. That equipment before I have the real equipment. And all you are claiming, you have van, you have loudspeaker, you have this, you have that. Billy Graham has more equipment than all the Pentecostals put together, my friend. Equipment. We are talking of Holy Ghost. Real Holy Ghost power. That equipment or no equipment. You know that you've got something. And when you have that real thing, the devil will know that you've got it. The demon world, they'll know that you have it. I know you cast out demons in your state, but one hour, two hours, three hours, all through the night, night vigil, casting out devil, you don't have the real thing. After casting out devil this week, and we say, praise the Lord, you are delivered. After three hours of labor and sweating, the person comes back two weeks again. And he says, they have come in again, they have come in again. And after that again, you labor for another three hours. Then he goes again, then he comes back. Why am I wasting my time? Why don't I say, my friend, go. I need to meet God myself. I won't, I won't labor for three hours. If I don't have the real thing, why not let the person go and settle himself for herself? And then I go to the Lord. I said, Lord, she needs demons cast out. I need a lump of stone or some depravity cast out of me for between me and you. I'm not going to see anybody, but here I am. I will not go until it is done. And when that is done, I call that person in five minutes. Before you get there, the demon knows you've got the real thing. Now, the devil is gone before you get there. Are you going to be on this thing on which you have been now? Are you going to be on that for the rest of your life? You like your method? You like how you are doing things? You like the level where you are? You are satisfied? Look at the people in the world. They had bicycles. If they had been satisfied, there would be no motorcycle. When they had motorcycle, if they had said, now we've got motorcycle, look at this, we never got it before. They'll never have a vehicle. I mean, in manufacturing. And when they had vehicles, if they, were, if they didn't know that the sky is the limit, that they can take to the air and get into an aeroplane, nobody will invent a thing. But look at the Christians. The world, they're going up in technology in education, in sociology, in everything, every study, every field, the church is going down. In science today, you know more than the scientists of old. In Christianity today, you know much, much less than the Christians and the preachers and the believers of yesteryears. Why is it like that? The world is wiser than the church. Now, the price to pay. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 12. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. There's a lot I've still got to say. Maybe I'll say these things in other messages. But now, you've seen what Jesus Christ himself said, that the kingdom of God suffereth violence. But then the violent take it by force. And now you have a chance either to remain at the level you are or to say, Lord, I'll rise up higher. I'll go up higher. I want something greater than I've got before. We're going to do something. We'll rise up and sing this song again before we pray. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I I want bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. Where love and joy and light abound. Lord, this is my desire. Plant my feet on higher ground. I'm pressing on. Lord, lift me up 
and light abound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fear is me. My constant aim is a dear crown. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on ever stable land. Where the wonder and I abound. My feet on O Lord, we come before you this day. We acknowledge that we have gone away, gone so low from the standard we have seen in the scriptures this day, O Lord. And with our hearts broken, we come before you. And we are asking, O Lord, that all those things that have hitherto hindered us from receiving all you have for us, you will remove them this day in Jesus' name. Our Father, we lay our lives before you. We lay our plans before you. We lay our future before you. We lay our goals before you. We lay everything in us before you. Oh Lord, accept our consecration in Jesus' name. Amen. Accept our sacrifice in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we are promising you this day we are ready to pay the price. We are willing to pay the price. Whatever it will take us to go back to the Bible, and go back to the Old New Testament standard and receive your power and receive your anointing and receive your vision. Lord, we will pay it in Jesus' name. Amen. And we are praying, Heavenly Father, as we have laid everything on the altar, starting from this morning, O God, pour out your spirit in the real Pentecostal manner in Jesus' name. Amen. Let it take possession of our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Let it anoint us with power in Jesus' name. Amen. Let signs and wonders follow us in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm so excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my department. Same thing, and I thank God because I'll be graduating in 